Monica home. We are here right now with Stuart Pfeiffer, the reporter that broke the story for us in today's LA Times, uh, along with Robert Whitman. Robert is a former FBI agent that specialized in fine art uh, or fine art heists. He's coming to us from Pennsylvania, and Stuart's here with us in Los Angeles. Let's start out with Stuart. Why don't you give us an update on exactly what happened uh, over the uh, last few weeks to uh, Jeffrey Gunlock? Great. Thank you. Uh, here's what we do know. Uh, Mr. Gunlock said he returned to his Santa Monica home September 14th after a two-day vacation, or actually a business trip to New York. When he got home, he found his walls stripped bare and a number of valuable paintings missing. Uh, the paintings were worth an estimated $10 million. Also uh, taken during this heist was some, some expensive wine, some jewelry, and his Porsche Carrera. Uh, now, some of the artworks included a Mondrian, a Jasper Johns, uh, a number of others uh, were taken, um, and they were all fine art. There's one in particular, the Mondrian has a million dollar uh, bounty uh, for it. Is that how much he's willing to, to give, Stuart? Yeah, yesterday Mr. Gunlock held a uh, brief news conference, I would say $1.7 million uh, reward for return of all the paintings. One million dollars of that is for the Mondrian. Uh, which sold at auction 10 years ago for 5.3 million. So, you know, it's probably worth a, a lot more than that right now, but he is offering a million dollars for the return of that painting. And that is believed to be the largest uh, reward ever offered for a single painting. Well, why don't we, uh, why don't we go to you, Robert? Uh, you're the expert in all this. Um, we were talking uh, offline before we started this uh, chat about some of your experiences uh, that you would go in and purchase uh, stolen art, but let's just start with the matter right now. What do you think? Where do you? What do you think this art is? Where is it on the streets? Uh, what are the? What are the the thieves likely doing at this very moment? Well, I think right now at this moment, Joe and uh, Stuart, I think the thieves are probably looking at their artwork. They're probably hiding it, uh, trying to figure out what they're going to do with it. Um, the when, when someone goes in and does a job like this. Uh, and they're not just taking art, they're taking wine, as you said, they're taking jewelry, uh, stealing a car. It sounds to me like this is a, a haphazard, a, a semi-haphazard job. Uh, they may have had the uh, residents, you know, staked out to do this kind of a thing, but when it came down to actually stealing what they were going to take, it sounds to me like they took more than just a targeted, uh, you know, a targeted robbery would do. So I would think at this point they've got a lot more than they actually thought they would have gotten. Yeah, they got more than what they could handle. And they're probably sitting around trying to figure out what they're going to do with it. Yeah, and, and at this point, do they do they are people going to try to? I mean, what, what could they possibly do uh, at this point? I mean, it's not like they're sophisticated enough where they can, you know, call up somebody that would deal in in looted art, right? Well, that's that's the problem. When it comes to art theft, it's one of the le most, uh, um, you know, unreasonable crimes, and it's not very very lucrative in the end because. You know, the very nature of art and the value of art is based on three things. Authenticity, the provenance, and legal title. And if any of those three things don't exist or are not involved in, in the artwork, then the artwork's not worth anything. So in this case, we do not have legal title. These people who have these paintings don't have legal title. Therefore, they're not going to be able to sell them to the collectors who would pay the kind of money that, that we're talking about. Uh, hey, Stuart, you, I know you had a number of questions. Feel free to jump in uh, w with some questions of your own. Well, I, I, had, I did have one question. What are the chances that these thieves might be able to use a, you know, a middleman to somehow claim the reward? Is that their best chance of getting paid? Well, it depends on how the reward offer has been written. I don't know the details of how the reward offer was written. When I was with the FBI, we would often offer rewards, usually through insurance companies. Uh, basically, though, we would word them in such a way that, you know, individuals who are involved in the actual crime would not be eligible to receive the monies. So it would depend on how these rewards offers are written, what was said, and uh, what, you know, what they intend to pay. Yeah, I know in this case, uh, Gunlock, he just wants to get the art recovered. Uh, he doesn't even care about the prosecution. Mm -hmm. At least that's what he's telling us. But in that case, if, if he's not worried about the prosecution, it's not like... What they could they could call the tip line and drop it off at his house. I mean, how how do those things sort of work? Well, that's that's problematic. Okay, um, the problem with with that in the United States is that that's considered ransom. 
Uh, it also could be obstruction of justice, depending on the situation. Uh, they were they used to do that in England, uh, in Britain. People would pay uh, money for rewards. Uh, they would get the material back without anybody being arrested or any questions asked. Uh, that law was changed in around 2001 by Parliament uh, because of the fact that it was considered money laundering. So. In the United States, it's very difficult to be able to do that at this point. I mean, I'm, I'm not giving legal advice here, but but uh, in the situations that I was involved in as an FBI agent, you know, basically the information uh, was, was supplied, we recovered the painting, and if the person was involved in the actual theft many times, they could not collect all the reward. Uh, so it's a very, very touchy situation uh, that we're talking about. Right. You have to remember, just to, just to oh, amplify that too, you have to remember that there's two different you know, groups of thought. It could be that Mr. Gunlab wants his paintings back, which is which is fine. But there's another group of thought. The police are probably more interested in catching the criminals. So you have two separate situations here that are going on. It could be going on, and they're not necessarily going to work together. Well, how do I put it? They're not necessarily going to go in the same direction. Let's put it that way. Gotcha. That was going to be my question. Uh, the Santa Monica police have been fairly tight-lipped about this investigation so far. We do know that they're working with uh, the FBI, Interpol, Los Angeles police. We don't know much about what they're doing. What do you think they're doing at this point to try to you know, investigate this and help Mr. Gunlock recover his stolen paintings? Well, there, there are standard operational procedures that you must go through as, a, as an investigator. I mean, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to do a forensic investigation of the actual residence to see if there's been any evidence left behind, fingerprints, you know, uh, shoe prints, anything of that nature. And that's just standard in any burglary. You want to look at how the the individuals entered the uh, the residence, see how they got in, see if there's any type of evidence there as far as that's concerned, tool and die marks. After that's done, that's a standard investigation. Then there's going to be specific things you would do for an art theft investigation. One of those would be to put the word out, as they did very quickly, to make sure that the artworks don't go underground, that they're not sold to some unwitting buyers who don't realize what they have. So you want to put it out so that the galleries, the collectors in the area, they all know exactly what's going on. Then you want to you would don't want to uh, notify the databases, you know, the Art Loss Register in London, the National Stolen Art File at FBI headquarters, and Interpol in Lyon, France. They all have databases that would put these artworks on the base. It would be uh, listed on, on their websites, and you would be able to check them. Anybody who's interested could check them. Um, and, you know, as far as that's concerned, that would be your due diligence as an investigator to make that happen. Hey, would, would you expect uh, uh, time is of the essence here? Like, in these sort of cases, do they get solved in a matter of days, typically, in weeks or years? I know the, the biggest... Um, uh, uh, one that we were talking about yesterday was that five was it five million Stewart the five million dollars yeah, the, the, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum artworks that were stolen in Boston in uh, 1990 right. 20 years ago right. they, they, they're offering five million dollars for the uh, information leading to the return of some really valuable irreplaceable uh, paintings that were stolen then and they've been missing since 1990 so what's right. what's the pace what's the pace like? Well, in that particular case, there was 13 artworks that were stolen from the Gardner Museum. Uh, just to give you a background, two individuals went up to the museum on St. Patrick's Day night in Boston, which, as you might guess, is a very popular night. Okay. And they, they were dressed as Boston police officers. They duped the two guards into letting them in. And for the next hour and, and some odd minutes, they went around the museum and stole the 13 artworks. Uh, the total value of that heist at the time was somewhere around $300 million. Today, those artworks which have not been returned, all 13, none of them have been returned, that value is up to about $500 million. And that is the largest single property crime in U.S. history. Uh, you know, many people might think of, you know, Bernie Madoff and these types of Ponzi schemes as being larger, which they are. But when you talk about a property crime, a specific property crime at one time, that is the largest. It is an art theft. So, you know, that that is there is a $5 million reward being offered now for information that leads to the recovery of those pieces. And in fact, in 1995, a federal law was passed, which made it a criminal, uh, a criminal law or a criminal statute to uh, steal from a museum. So as a result of that theft, you know, the federal government uh, and Congress responded by creating a law which makes it illegal to steal from a museum federally, not just locally. Right. Well, we're getting, uh, we're getting close to our, our time uh, to end this. Stuart, you want to 
want to dig in with one last uh, question uh, from your story. Yeah, I'd like to hear from Mr. Whitman at least maybe one example of a case where he went overseas and recovered some stolen artwork. I mean, how does something like this work where, where uh, law enforcement goes undercover, makes a buy, and, and arrest people? Uh, <laughs> yesterday, as I noted in, in our article today, Mr. Whitman told me that oftentimes the only uh, customers that these thieves can find end up being undercover law enforcement like him back in his day with the eye. Uh, a case like this all. Right. Well, you know, so we still do those investigations. I run a, a company now called Robert Whitman Incorporated, and we do art theft recovery investigations. We have probably 40 cases open at this point. Um, and that's what we do for a living. So, yeah, we do go undercover. It depends on the situation, on what, what's, what's going on. We work hand in hand with law enforcement. And in, in my career as, the FBI, as an FBI agent for over 20 years, I was involved in recovery of more than $300 million worth of uh, stolen art and artifacts. In a number of those cases, probably a dozen to 15, I was undercover uh, buying those artifacts, uh, doing sting operations to get them back. And we worked in countries like uh, Copenhagen, Sweden, uh, Paris, uh, France, uh, Spain, Germany, and in all those countries, we were able to recover artworks. Uh, one case in particular involved 17 paintings that were stolen from a, a, a person, a private home in, in Madrid, Spain. We developed information that these paintings were missing. We, we developed information of who had them. And so we went undercover. In that case, I acted as an authentic heir for, the, for the, uh, an organized crime group. And we were able to meet with the uh, criminals and make an offer to buy them. Uh, at that point, we recovered the paintings. One was a Bruegel. Another was a, a piece by Goya worth fifteen million. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we we can work on these cases. They do uh, they do work out many times. Well, very good. Thank you very much, Robert, for joining us uh, here, and thank you, Stuart, for the story and your questions today. I'm Joe Bill Bruno, deputy business editor of the LA Times. Stay tuned to latimes.com all day long for up to the minute news, and that's it from here. Thank you. Great, Stuart and Joe. Thanks so much. All right.